Oh, hello there. Welcome to Comic Relief. This was once um, arguably the greatest comic book store in the world. If you watch this channel, you may have already seen our live stream memorial to its creator and proprietor, the late, great Rory Root. That'll be airing, uh, that aired Tuesday. Hope that you can make it to that. But today, I figured there's no more appropriate place to talk about the cartoonist we're going to talk about today than a store like Comic Relief. Because Jason Shiga is a cartoonist unlike many others, and he's one that you're most likely not going to find in very many traditional comic book stores. That's a shame. I hope that changes, but you can find them in bookstores and all over the place, in the kids section, in the adult, in the fiction and literature section, uh, of your better bookstores everywhere. I recently reviewed um, his first and my favorite of his early works, a, a mini comic called Fleep. You can check out that review. But now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce you um, to... The guy who officially is my favorite cartoonist that I discovered in the 21st century. That sounds like high praise, although I just haven't read that many cartoons in the 21st century. But man, nobody excites me more than this guy, Jason Shiga. Welcome to the show. Hi, everyone. Hey. Great to have you on. I really appreciate you um, getting on this call. Of um, course. Glad to be here. Especially since you haven't seen my Fleep review yet, which for all you know, I might have savaged. <laughs> but I, did. I have to say that uh, that that uh, backdrop of yours looks really realistic. For a second, I thought you were actually at Comic Relief. Which don't destroy the illusion, Jason. That's what this is all about. <laughs> right now, we're both at Comic Relief, right? Because, well, so you're Wait. from the East Bay. You're from the East Bay, right? Yes. Of course. So you, so what? You tell me what you know about comic relief and what you think about comic relief, and 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 just give me, give us a little taste of of that before we start. Oh man, it was, uh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, it was, it was everything to me. Um, when I uh, first got into comics, I bought my first comic book there. I sold my first mini comic there. Um, I was everything and. Uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, when I, when I think about Comic Relief and Rory Root and, uh, yeah, all those, uh, all those, just those great fun afternoons, uh, hanging out in the store, reading books and, you know, uh, buying mini comics. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I have, I have a lot of fond memories, um, of the store, of the place, of the people that work there, um. You know all those uh, all these cartoonists, um, like uh, I'm trying to think, like uh, Ben Catmull and Landry Walker, Eric Jones. Uh, I think Sophie Ed, Crum actually worked there for a bit. Ed Brubaker. Uh, that's right, Ed Brubaker. Um, Ed Brubaker fired for stealing from Comic Relief. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! <laughs> Check out his low life comics for details on that, folks. You'll understand that a little bit better. Um, yeah, well, I, I always wondered if that uh, if if that uh, that character, the uh, the comic book store owner, was based on uh, Rory Root. Oh man, do you mean like the <laughs> Simpsons comic book store guy, or the one from uh, the one from Low Life? Yes, right. And well, there's a very good chance, and at, Rory Root has appeared in many many different comics because, like you said, all of the different indie creators that went th in there would draw him into their comics because. Yeah, yeah. The one I heard about was... Feldman oh, sorry. from Eight Ball. I I heard Feldman from Eight Ball was uh, based on Rory Root. I believe it. I believe it. And and anybody <laughs> who knew the guy, like he had a just a, a a little bit of a mixed reputation. You know, anybody who wears who styles himself with a black hat, like <laughs> there was there were there there was a dual nature to Rory. While he was one of my favorite people ever. Um, he, he also did some things that pissed off a few people here and there and did some weird things. Um, but <laughs> God bless him. It was all to keep this thing going, like the greatest testament to comics that I've, that I've been in um, as far yeah. as the store. Yeah. So this is not about Rory, though, man. This is I'll, about um, you. 
Um, well, I hope that I, you join. I was hoping I could share a story about the uh, the very first mini comic that I sold, which oh, was the comic do. relief. Please do. Um, so it's um, I uh, it was also the the very first comic that I drew ever, and uh, I re I remember uh, you know, I'd go into comic relief, I'd see their mini comic section. I didn't know I didn't even know they were called mini comics. Um. But uh, I talked to the uh, mini comics buyer at the time. His name was Josh Petrin, and uh, I asked uh, I asked if they bought homemade comics. Um, and uh, he yeah he told me um, not even on consignment. Um, they uh, you know they they buy it for half the cover price. Um, and uh, I didn't I didn't know anything about making mini comics, but uh, you know I had I had this comic that I drew. I went to the copy store and you know I tried. Um, I didn't know how to like make a dummy or anything, so I like tried tried to do like the mathematics. Like okay, so the first page is going to be on the twenty fourth page, which means that and you know I was like driving myself crazy, but I did it. I you know I had this uh, comic book which. Um, was huge because um, I printed it on 11 by 17 paper uh, and folded it in half. I brought it back to the store and um, they told me um, be, because it was so huge, it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't uh, fit on the shelves without just flopping over. Um, that I needed a cardstock cover. Um, I didn't know where to get cardstock. Um, but uh, I had some manila folders at home and I very carefully cut these manila folders into the size of an 11 by 17 sheet. Um, I fed it, you know, I very carefully fed it through this uh, photocopy machine and I was able to make three copies uh, before the fourth one jammed the machine. Um, and I was so embarrassed, you know, I just paid for my three and then ran out of the store. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, I, st I stapled it all together, um, and yeah, brought it back to the store and they bought it. And that was the, uh, that was the very first comic I sold. The comic. Mike, any you got any copies of that around? I do not. <laughs> Folks, be on it, the lookout. What was the name of that mini comic? Uh, Phillips Head. Phillips head and uh, guys, this may be the rarest piece of uh, chic immobilia that it, that exists out there. If you have if you have a copy of Phillips head with a Manila folder uh, cover stock, uh, you you have one of the first three co comics that I that I made. Not the rare Manila variant. Oh, awesome, <laughs> Jason! So cool. Well, so, I mean, so that alone there points to you. How forward looking, like what other comic book store has a mini comics buyer, right? Like what other, what other store could you have even hoped to take it to that they would not only not laugh you out of there, but they're going to say, <laughs> sure, kid, I got cash up front to give you for those hand stapled things and how to yeah. market and probably sold them quickly. Oh, it was crazy. It was crazy. I went, I remember I went back uh, like a week later and one of them was gone. One of them had sold. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this, Jason. Well, so that was the beginning. And I assume that your style was probably different, but probably not unsimilar to how you draw today. And your style is unique. It's eye-catching. And it's unlike almost anything out there on the comic shelf at all. Um, so it's really attractive to the eye. It brings people in. And then once you read it, you're writing the kind of stuff that I have never read in a mini com or in any kind of comic before. Um, while at the same time, like, like you have a really highbrow, interesting stuff with math and equations and stuff, but then you'll throw in a lot of like vi ultra violence and action movie references and things like that, that make it a really interesting balance. I really enjoy reading your work um, because of the formal aspects of it, but then also that you don't seem to take yourself too 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 seriously that you can't have fun with your comics too um so tell me about your influences tell me how you came to be who you are man um let's see well uh 
So I think I think I'm a little unusual for uh, cartoonists my age in that uh, I actually don't have a lot of uh, superhero influences. Um, I uh, I discovered uh, comics relatively late. I was maybe t- 19, 20 um, when I read my first comic. Um, Which and, was? Uh, uh, there were two actually, uh, Understanding Comics and Mouse. So uh, I got off to okay. a great start. All right, folks, we can see where the starting point comes from here. All right, I was reading Bazooka Joe or whatever it was, and, and this guy's reading McLeod and Spiegelman. So, okay, all right, good start. Then what? Um, but yeah, it's um, so it's uh, it's funny. Um, it, I mean, right, you know, right after right after reading Mouse and Understanding Comics, uh. Um, I, you know, I thought I want to make my own comics and, uh, that, yeah, that's what I did. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, um, I skipped, I skipped a lot of the, uh, the, um, I guess you could call them the, you know, kind of the, uh, the more, um, like, you know, like Spider-Man, Marvel. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, sure. even though, you know, I love, I love comic strips, Garfield when I was a kid. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, I'd say, um, even, even though I loved understanding comics and mouse, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't cite them as influences. Uh, uh, Matt Groening was, uh, was a big influence. You could probably see that, um, uh, Lot, there's a, uh, Malaysian cartoonist named Lot. He's, uh, he's huge in Malaysia. Um, Kampung boy, right? boy, right? Yeah, Kampung boy, um, town boy. I think uh, was his masterpiece. Um, and uh, when I was uh, when I was living in uh, Singapore, I, uh, which is uh, you know kind of right at the southern tip of Malaysia, um, he was huge over there. Um, and um, yeah, I mean you know other uh, other than comics, uh, I. You know, I I love uh, like you said, I love action movies. Uh, John Woo. Uh, uh, I love uh, you know, I love all the um, uh, kind of those uh, Hong Kong movies from the eighties and nineties, uh, like early Jackie Chan, Police Story, uh, Super Cop, uh, and then uh, in terms of uh, in terms of books. Um, there's, um, there's actually one, um, I love science fiction. Uh, I kind of, um, even though I grew up in the, uh, in the eighties and nineties, um, my influences were kind of one generation, uh, before that. So I think it's silver age, kind of like, uh, sixties, uh, Kind of uh, space age uh, sci-fi. Um, what's like, a, what's, uh, a, good, what's, a, what's a good what's an example? Like two thousand one, the stuff Arthur C. Clarke was doing back in the sixties. Uh, okay. Isaac okay. Asimov, uh, you know those guys. PKD. Um, PKD. Who? Philip K. Dick. Philip K. Dick. Oh yeah, yeah, I love Philip K. Dick. Um, I, I generally lean more towards uh, like hard sci-fi. Um, you know, and anything uh, you know, anything with like a some giant rocket ship on the cover. Um, okay, and, wait a minute. Uh, okay, wait a minute. Side, side, side side line. Side line. Yes. The movie Starship Troopers. The movie Troopers. Starship Troopers. Yes. You love it. You love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. okay. All right. I, All right. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, no, it's great. It's great. Um, it's, it's, I'd say it's, uh, it's more. It's more relevant than ever. Uh, you ain't kidding. It's. Uh, you I ain't mean, kidding. It's like I'd say. I'd say the um, the theme of a lot of uh, Verhoeven movies is um, is uh, uh, sort of um, a satire fascism. Yeah. Um, and yeah. uh, from what I from what I know of his uh, personal biography, I, he actually grew up. Um, like in uh amsterdam uh like uh during world war ii so he he like as a kid he was seeing some crazy things firsthand 
Um, but yeah, I, I love I love the way he uh, just yeah just works in these themes and in, into his movies. Well, the um, reason I bring that up too. Well, the reason is uh, I'm muting you for a second because I'm having echo issues. Um, but the reason I that I um, I bring him up is reminds me of your work because there's while there's there's satire and 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 humor certainly. And and ultra violence though at the same time and like taking it over the top but still taking it kind of tongue in cheek, just reminds me of your work most mostly like book hunter and demon probably, uh, remind me of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, um. Yeah. Ver Verhoeven, Verhoeven's a he. Uh, um. I don't know if he's. I don't know if he saw his latest one. L. Um, it was in French with, um, oh, uh, what's her face? Isabelle Huppert. Uh, it was oh. freaking astounding. It was amazing. Huh. Uh, I'd, re wow. I'd recommend it if, if you get a chance. I, I would like to, and I'm glad you brought up France, because we're going to get to that in a minute. We're going to get to your um, French experience and... French subsidization in just a moment. But so let's go back. I know I took us on a tangent there, but it was worth it. So you created your first mini comics and you sold them at Comic Relief. I think I probably saw you not too long after that, I would guess, early 21st century, probably at the Alternative Press Expo in San Francisco, where I think that's where I picked up Fleep. And I was like, instantaneously, I'm like, this guy and this guy gets me. Like I get like, the, the 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 scientificness and the fun and the cartooniness and the design and everything it just hits a sweet spot for me personally and um I've, I've always been a big fan i used to go and bug you at those conventions all the time you may or may not remember but um uh I, and i, I tried to buy your stuff for my store for my store and, my store and um i had a comic book store at that time and uh and anyway i was just such a crazy it's such a crazy new type of comic that just wasn't out there. It just hit such a sweet spot. I loved it. I want you to talk about like those early days and the, 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 the mini comic scene and the ape scene and, and, and um, how you, you know, spread your work around. Okay. Well, um, I loved, yeah, I loved, I loved those early days of, uh, of comics. Um, I think, I would say my uh, my favorite era of comics is the kind of um, 90s, early 2000s uh, comics, um, especially like the uh, the stuff, the anagraphics and uh, D&Q were putting out then. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, uh, I don't know, there's this kind of excitement in the air that, uh, you know, co comics, Comics could, you know, they could be about anything. They're, you know, they're not just for kids anymore. Um, whereas, uh, I don't, yeah, it, it seems it seems to have uh, like uh, reversed in uh, in recent years. Uh, you know, now now comics seems it seems like they're for kids again, um, or and you know, at least the uh, the, the best selling ones are. Uh, well, thank goodness too, because like there was just this time when it's like, where are you going to get that next generation of readers from? And, and now with the stuff that's going on um, from Scholastic, everything from Bone to um, Raina Telgemeier and everything else, I'm, I'm so jazzed about like the, where the future of comics are going to go is, is going to go because of that. Well, what do you think about that? Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm super excited about it too. Um, but for me personally, late yeah 90s early 2000s are, are the are the Not. the golden Not. years <laughs> the, they're they're the golden age for me um okay so it's wait a minute, okay, so, so, talk wait a minute. About, so talk about um the cartoonist from that era so for me peter bag uh evan dorkin um dan klaus of course uh um you tell me Chester Brown, yummy fur. Horse. Horse. Um, yeah, all yeah, those 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 three Canadian guys, Seth, Joe, Matt. You know, um, I uh, although yeah, I think I think uh, Seth and Joe, Matt were doing their best work in the uh, you know nineties and uh, early. Sorry, 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 sorry. 
Keep, oh, continue, no worries. Please. Keep, continue, please. Um, but uh, but you know, and there there were the big names, but there were so there were so many, so many mini comics that were being made back then. It's um, it's it's all it's impossible to describe just the volume of like mini yeah just mini comics of like super low print runs uh i I remember i would you know i'd go into comic relief you know bringing this back to comic relief and uh you could buy mini comics by the pound you could buy like you know for five bucks or something you could get you can walk home with a pound (laughs) of mini comics and i would you know i just do that and like just read just read every single one um and uh you know Letters pages, um, yeah, letters pages, and you know, just uh, we'd like go in on you know in the middle, like with issue you know twenty three or something, and uh, there's no way to get any of the earlier issues, and yeah, it was there was just so much stuff, um, and you know there it was yeah it's like the um it was like the 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 medium. Uh, was just fresh and new. Um, p- you know, people had you know blasted open the holes, and you know they were just mining mining chunks of uh, you know of ore out of uh, out of these uh, out of these holes. It was yeah, it was such an exciting time to be reading and making comics. Um, but uh, but getting to getting to Fleep, it's um, that. Uh, Fleep actually started off as a weekly comic in an alternative weekly. Um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, uh, right uh, right out of college, um, I got a job uh, at Asian Week. And uh, every week, uh, they would print one page from Fleep. Okay, we're back. Couple technical difficulties there, but through the magic of editing, who's even gonna know? Jason, you hear me okay now? <laughs> so, oh yeah. Oh, much better. Uh, now. Okay, perfect. No but... echo either. Okay, okay, that's good. Cool. Okay, so um where we were was you were we were talking about um fleep in the early days and you 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 graduated from the School of Comics Relief Minis and went on to Ape and started uh, and 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 wrote Fleep, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. So, um, like I was saying, uh, Fleep actually started off as a um, as a, a newspaper comic for a weekly newspaper in San Francisco called Asian Week, and uh, basically one. Um, uh, each one of those pages would appear every week. Um, and uh, I guess the idea is over the course of uh, 42 weeks, I would I would tell one story. Um, the, the, the tragic part of this all is that uh, I think, oh gosh, maybe like 36, uh, 36 weeks into its run, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, a mere five or six uh, strips before the end, uh, the strip got canceled. Oh, my and gosh. Readers, uh, yeah, these readers never, uh, yeah, never uh, figured out what happened. Uh, but oh, then that is, vacuum. Uh, yeah. This, uh, this strip you, you have right now is uh, is one of my proudest moments uh, of the strip in which I... I, I I got to have a main character drinking a giant bowl of his own urine in in the in the pages of a weekly newspaper. Can I just say that uh, I, I stopped on this for a reason. It's my favorite page of the entire thing. This was the moment. <laughs> I have a rule when I look when I'm browsing for comics and I pick something up or or a book at all. If it's supposed to be funny and I open it up to a random page and if I laugh, I'm in. I buy it. And man, you. Nailed it. Um, this was my this is my favorite, and I go into it in detail in my review. Like well, I stop on uh, this one and, know, I, and I talk about it. Oh, <laughs> um, so yeah, it, I had I had to be a little sneaky about this because um, 
I pl I planned it because I knew uh, there was uh, there was a shift in editors uh, on a certain week in Asian week. Um, so I planned it so that one editor would read the strip uh, where Jimmy was urinating into the in, into the giant bowl. Um, that and I got away with that. Um, you know, it was it was done tastefully. And then in the second week, when they had a completely different editor, uh, that's when I was able to uh, to and the, uh, the second editor did not know that the bowl was filled with urine. I told her that it was filled with rainwater. That's hilarious so because if, if you notice in that in that page, he never actually mentions that it's urine. That's what I was just about to say, and and it almost makes it better. And, and and it's all about context, right? And that's the key of comics in general. So that's that's a that's a killer story. Um, so yes. oh, one of my so, proudest moments to this day. Okay, but so then you had this Asian Week audience hungry for the end, right? Like, how could you get to thirty page thirty six of Fleep and then be like, "What now? What's going to happen?" So you took that pent up demand and you said, "I got to put out." A mini comic? How did it work? How did Spark Plug books come into play? Um, so I, uh, yeah, I published it as a mini comic first um, after the uh, after the run at Asian Week, and um, I guess uh, I guess after that uh, I was I was picked up by uh, uh, by Dylan Williams at uh, at Spark Plug, and that. That is the the nice looking uh, spark plug version. Um, it's uh, it was actually the first uh, the first book that spark plug uh, published. And a great uh, so one! What a way to launch! What a way to launch! Um, I'm very I'm very proud of that. Any idea how many he sold? Um. At least two thousand, because I know yeah, the initial print run great. was two thousand, and it uh, went into a second printing uh, a few years later. That's um, great. But uh, beyond that, I'm I'm not sure how how many. Because I mean, you can read this for, for for free online, but I'm I'm not a fan of digital comics most of the time. And uh, I went looking where can I buy a paper copy of Fleet? Cheapest I found it for was forty bucks on Amazon. No way. Oh, man. Totally. And okay. And speaking of Amazon, speaking of Amazon, um, after Fleep, you went on and put out some other books. Okay. And another one from Spark Plug that you put out was this Book Hunter. Yes. yes. Okay. This was an unqualified hit at my store, Hijinx Comics. I sold. So many copies, so many copies. And then I put it on Amazon and I would buy dozens and dozens of copies from Dylan, from Spark Plug, through oh. Tony Shenton, I think. And I would just, because nobody else was selling it on Amazon. And I probably sold a couple hundred book hunters maybe on Amazon. Um, but it was it's an easy sell. Everyone who reads it loves it and recommends it to all their like bookish type friends and um, tell me about Book Hunter. Tell me where it came from and and, and the genesis. Um, well, uh, yeah, I'm you know um, I'm I'm a big fan of the uh, police procedural uh, genre of uh, you know of um, in uh, you know in books. Um, I guess the uh, TV shows, uh, but the uh, I guess the one. Um, uh, the one that was the biggest influence was um, one called uh, Red Dragon by Thomas Harris. I don't know if you yeah. know that one. Prequel to Silence of the Lambs is one of my favorite books. Silence of the Lambs is one of my all-time favorites, and Red Dragon is awesome. Oh, yeah. Actually, it's not a prequel. Yeah. yeah. It was the predecessor, right, to Silence of the Lambs. It actually was written before. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It came out first. Um it it was great. Silence is great. Hannibal, meh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Um, you, you can tell, you can tell uh, Thomas Harris just wanted to write a book, uh, you know, about Italy that didn't involve a Hannibal Lecter at all. And maybe, just, uh, maybe. Just worked, worked, worked into <laughs> it. Uh, just, just wedged him in there. Um, but uh, so, give me the parallels. Yeah, give me yeah. the parallels. Red Dragon and Book Hunter. Um, yeah, you know, there. Uh, I'm I'm super into uh, you know, uh, competent crack teams of you know technicians, uh, you know, de dedicated to you know, you know, solving some forensic mystery. Um, it was uh, it's funny the um, uh, th that sort of genre has uh kind of taken off with um. Uh, oh, what's that show? CSI and Bones. CSI, or, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, there's like, yeah, there's there's a ton, there's a ton of those TV shows now. Um, but uh, although, I mean, yeah, I would put I, yours though in a different. It's almost, it's got a little. It's got that stuff for sure, all the technical stuff. But then balls out action scenes and bus chase scenes and crazy caper crimes that happen that they don't usually get into in those kind of in, in in like a csi yeah yeah um so uh i guess some, something uh something you may have noticed about uh my early comics is uh they're they're aristotelian in a sense that they're all mm. they're all set in one location um they're all set in one location over like, you know, a very limited amount of time. Um, I think in, uh, you know, Fleep, it was whatever, 36 hours and Book Hunter, it's, you know, uh, 72 hours or something. Um, but, uh, but that, uh, I guess, um, I like, I'd like to tell people, I like to tell people that um, I like to set formal restrictions for myself um the uh i guess every every scene uh except for one uh in book hunter is set in a library or a bookmobile of some sort um but i'll tell you the truth which is uh in the early days um it was it was very challenging for me to uh to draw to draw things um uh, at first I could only, you know, I could only draw a phone booth, you know, I could, it took, it took forever. And I, you know, I had to, I had to work really hard, um, at, uh, yeah, just drawing like the simplest things, but, um, but yeah, uh, I, you know, I got, I was able to get pretty good at drawing a phone booth from all these different angles. And then once I had that, um, I, you know, I, I figured I can, I can write my way around. Um, my ability to draw. Well, let me just uh, say um, that, you know, that that with book it, hunter. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say it shows a real progression. Oh, go ahead. Like, it shows a real progression. Obviously, from flip, like it, it got super ambitious because now, you know, there's complicated scenes inside of giant libraries. There's chase scenes. There's close-ups of technical things, and and I explored a lot of stuff that. Like it was clear you're stretching your wings from what you were doing on Fleep to get to Book Hunter. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's like a car chase in there. There's like helicopters. Uh, um, yeah. I was, you know, I was, I was, I was put, you know, trying to push myself um, to, you know, kind of the uh, the boundaries of, uh, you know, what I, what I was capable of as a as a cartoonist. Um, although, yeah, I mean, now nowadays, I I feel. I feel I've reached the point where I could I could draw just about anything. And, and so, how long did that you know, take you? you know, I mean, were you draw before you got into comics? Were you like an artist? To, like you like to draw and doodle, or or what? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I've I've always I've always enjoyed draw enjoy drawing and doodling. Uh, animation. I was super into animation when I was younger. Um, and uh, I should I should tell you, um, my uh, my dad was actually an animator. Um, he worked on the uh, Rudolph the Red Nose uh, stop motion uh, oh. Christmas special that uh, you see on TV every year. Rankin Bass. Um, a lot of right? people don't know, but 
that's the one. It was actually um, uh, large large chunks of that were actually made in uh, in Tokyo uh, when my dad was living there. Ah, huh. fascinating. And so is it? You, so you then you uh, grew up in sort of a house like that was like an animation house. Your dad like into that uh, like as a as an art form, or was it just kind of a job? Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was, you know, it was his passion when he was younger and, you know, living in Japan. Um, but, uh, by, yeah, by the time, uh, you know, by the time I came around, he was, uh, you know, he was in America, um, you know, it was hard for him, uh, because of the language barrier to, you know, find uh, the type of job in the state. Um, he was, you know, he was working uh, in brush restaurants or, you know, produce produce stores. Um, but you know, he we we'd still, you know, uh, do you know sumie together and uh, watercolors and yeah. I mean, you know, so I I grew I grew up with that uh, around the house. So um, and then you grew up in the states, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, because so, so I think this is your next book. I might be wrong. Um, well, no, this was before Book Hunter, right? This was self published. Double Happiness was self published. It says Shiga Books on the back. And if I'm correct, that came before Book Hunter. So it looks like you went sleep with Spark Plug and then you did some self publishing. You went back to Spark yeah, Plug was... for Book Hunter. No, no, double double happiness was before everything. It was, that was before Book Hunter, it was before Fleet. Oh. Um, and um, it was uh, it was actually a mini comic. Um, and uh, what's kind of interesting is I applied for a Zarek grant, and uh, that's how I that's how I got the funds to uh, uh, to self uh, okay. to self publish it. That sounds familiar now. And if anybody doesn't know, the Xeric Grant was a grant created by what? Was it Eastman or Laird? It was one it was of those Laird. guys. Right? It was. Peter. Yeah, it was amazing. They, I think, gosh, you know, if you ever get a chance, uh, go, and, go and read like the, um, the recipients of like the first five years of the Xeric Grant. It's, it is insane. It's like, a who's who of uh you know uh you know comics professionals uh working today like uh Jessica Abel and Tom Hart, Adrian Tomine. Uh, -huh. uh right yeah it what, is Jason Lutz not, was he one of those you guys go back and uh read yeah I think Jason Lutz was one of them uh but uh yeah I um Laird Peter Laird one of the uh creators of the uh Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, he he set up this foundation uh, um, where uh, basically um, you apply for this grant money. Uh, if you get it, um, you can get up to five thousand dollars to self-publish uh, your own comic. And uh, I think the Zare grant had given away over one million dollars worth of grant money you know, over the, uh, whatever, 20 years that they were in existence. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing how many, uh, cartoonists of my generation just, uh, yeah, just came, just came from this, uh, this grant. Talk about taking that right. turtle's money and paying it forward for the whole industry. Right. And like taking it and like really moving things forward. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. It's, um, uh, but speaking, speaking of grants and funding, um, I I was thinking that would be a nice segue into talking about France. I agree. I want to get there in a second, though. But I want to go a little bit chronologically. Oh. I want to just say because okay. before you went to France, some Americans caught yes. notice of you, right? Like the people at Abrams took notice of some of your interactive experimental comics and you produced Meanwhile, a kid's right. book. And then you went on to do Empire State uh, for Abrams as well. Talk, just talk a little bit about that if you can. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so uh, 
you may have seen uh, Meanwhile as a mini comic at Ape way back in, you know, 2001, 2000. Um, you know, I, I made it kind of around the same time as, uh, you know, Double Happiness and Fleep and Book Hunter. Um, but it did not get published until 10 years later. It was, it took forever uh, to get that published because um, I don't know if uh, you can kind of hold that uh, book up uh, to the camera, yeah. Yeah. but if you can see um, inside, uh, every single page is a unique shape. Every single page is die cut. Die There's cut. these uh, tabs that kind of run run along the sides of each page um, that kind of uh, tell the reader uh which page to turn to next it's uh meanwhile is uh, essentially uh, a choose your own adventure style comic book where readers get to make choices and those choices lead to uh to different outcomes right but um, it's not just simple like go, go to this page or this page we're going amongst pages and back in pages you've gone before and you're time traveling and seeing yourself in other panels and Really innovative stuff that I'd never seen before. For those interested and want to see more of the inside of this book, by the way, check out my review of Fleep. I go in-depth on the Million Dollar Comics Cam. We open this up and we take a closer look, too, at the die cuts and the, and the process. Um, um, and you also sold it, as I remember, not just as a mini comic, but also as like a maxi comic, like as a giant poster. Is, what, what, am I correct about that? Uh, that's right. I never, I never sold it as a giant poster. That was, um, that was kind of a uh, display I made for the uh, Cartoon Art oh. Museum. Uh, oh right. Uh, I probably tried to buy one off of you. But, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't sell it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I forgive you, Jason. There's, there's only one in existence, man. Oh, uh, but, uh, but yeah, the, um, I guess the, uh, uh, the point where um, I got. Uh, I got Meanwhile published um, by Abrams. That that was that was uh, that's where everything changed. Um, but how did that come about? The, how do you go from mini comics, self published, no major publisher, comics publisher picked you up that I ever saw? I don't know if you were made offers, maybe rejected them, but dude, I used to exhort people at companies like Fantagraphics. I was saying, you know, some of the guys you publish are okay, but I'd rather read a Shiga comic a hundred times than a hundred of some of the other guys that you're, that you're putting out there. And so somebody at Abrams saw it and saw what I saw in the sense that it was like, this is a unique and a singular vision and worth publishing and worth getting out there. And that would sell probably better outside of the traditional comic book world than it would inside of just the direct market. So how did that happen? How did they find you? What did that, what was that process like? Um, so let, yeah, so let's uh, we'll, we'll rewind to the year 2008, which was um, uh, kind of uh, a, a historically important year for comics. That was the year I think there were three there are three big kind of like New York Times best-selling comic books. There was um, Persepolis, there's Fun Home, and what was the third one? ABC, American Born Chinese. Um, so uh, up until that point, uh, there I'd say most um, most of the whatever the big six publishers um, they did not have comics uh, imprints. Um, but uh, after those three graphic novels uh, kind of hit it big, um, there yeah there's like this boom. There's like this. Uh, I don't know this uh, this gold rush to uh, to start um, publishing graphic novels, um, and yeah, it was just it was a crazy time. I I just remember and you know and the old uh, old hobo with a mini comic was you know suddenly being offered uh, you know some you know crazy advance and some you know some three book deal and uh, yeah all I think all six or most. Oh, five of the six anyways uh, um there yeah there was like half a dozen uh major publishers with comics imprints starting that year um and yeah i was uh you know it's just kind of one of those uh 
right place at the right time. Um, you know, after well, I well, I guess there was you know the ten years that I was doing comics before that, but um, but yeah, right place, right time, and uh, yeah. Mean meanwhile, well, was uh, <clears throat> I had that kind of uh, talked and ready to to show people, um, when that time hit, and uh, they uh, yeah, they loved it. Uh, I went to New York and uh, you know uh tried to dazzle them with a you know a presentation and uh that, that i guess the rest is history i you know came back from new york uh quit, quit my job at the library and uh i've been doing uh comics full-time ever since well was there any pushback from there to like jason we like this thing but come on die cuts and what like like was there pushback or that or were they like oh we love this we have to do this we know how to uh, do no, it. No, no pushback. Uh, yeah, uh, there was no pushback. Um, I guess uh, I'd I'd been I'd been trying to get Meanwhile published for years, for years, uh, for a decade. Um, and the I guess the the pushback, if anything, was from the um, from the uh, smaller publishers that I uh, that I pitched to because um, die cuts are very expensive. Um, I. I forget how much it, it's, you know, whatever, $2,000 to print one die cut or to cast one die. Um, and so, you know, so there's a lot of upfront costs. Uh, it doesn't make sense if you're, you know, just printing 2,000 uh, of these comics, uh, mm. you know, to cast whatever, 80, 80 dies. Uh, but the, um, you know, it's one of these things that larger publishers can do because of, uh, you know, quantities of scale. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And, to, you know, to get those quantities of scale, you know, it's got to be, you know, a children's book. Um, but, you know, it, uh, if you. If you oh, I see. Because die cuts, of comment, course, that's common in children's books and nowhere else. Yeah. 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 I, that makes sense. Um, I didn't even think I didn't even think about that. Yeah. So anyways. And, um, and I'm noticing. There, this is a fifth printing, I think, right? That's what those numbers yeah. mean there, right? I know a little bit. I learned I a little so. bit of I library so. stuff in my days. <laughs> um, so they printed a lot of these things, man. It wasn't like it came out and it was a flop. You don't get five or more. I don't know how many printings it went through. Do you? Do you know what the print run? How many copies of Meanwhile are circulating out there? Um. There might be a sixth even there's one uh there's at least one after that um and uh yeah it's i mean it's by far my uh you know my most my most successful book it's uh you know i'm still still getting royalty checks to this day uh and uh yeah it's been it's been a great success great so you followed that up at abrams with uh with empire state right that was your next book am, am i right that was my next book Way different right. than any other Shiga book. Yes. Um, so it's uh, that uh, I'd say that book is um, well. What? Yeah. One of one of the influences that I have not told you about is uh, I love rom coms. I love romantic comedies. Uh, so that is that is kind of my my ode to uh, to rom coms. Um, one of one of the tropes that. Uh, that I really love is the uh, you know the, you know when uh, when two people kind of agree to to meet up at a certain place at a certain time, um, like in uh, Sleepless in Seattle. I think they did that in a uh, Before Sunrise too with uh, Ethan That's what Hawk I was and say. Julie Delpy. Um, yeah, uh, an affair to remember. Uh, oh, and there's um, have you seen uh, there's this new. Uh, new amazon show called run i don't know if you've seen that yeah uh but they yeah they kind of they kind of play with that trope anyways this it's one of my favorite tropes i love it and um, so, so you went third ink color but two different third ink colors right like you went with some of the pages are black and white and blue and some are black and white and red um uh yeah well so there's something there's something clever about that which is it's only two color printing um the what you think is black is actually purple that's a mixture of the red and the blue uh so it 
it looks it was I was able to make it look like there were three colors when in fact it was only two colors. Okay. So pause. That's a Shiga <laughs> thing. Like I'm gonna work so hard on process and do weird experiments that might not even to the end you they're they're not gonna realize the amount of work that that you put in or thought necessarily that you put into that. Um so like tell like what we're, we're going to talk about demon next and the, how you got into nude form forms of printing for yourself there. Um, so let's uh, maybe the, the talk about process a little bit and, 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 you know, um, the mechanics of what you do. Um, let's see. Well, uh, I, I think, um, I think in terms of process, I'm, uh, I'm, pretty typical um you know i i i do a script and then i do thumbnails i do pencils after that i do inks and then color, you know it's um i guess it's getting a, a little um rarer these days to uh to work that way but uh but yeah pretty you know pretty pretty much you know you know, every cartoon is my age uh you know kind of works in these uh layers i'd say the one um the one uh, kind of unique thing I do is I uh, I like to pencil out an entire project first before I begin on the inks. Uh, so, for example, um, for Demon, I penciled all 720 pages of Demon before I ink the first page. Um, I know, uh, like Chris Ware, for example, uh, you know, he I think he pencils one panel and then he inks it and then pencils the second panel and inks that. Uh, that drives me nuts every time I, I hear him talk about his process. But, uh, but well, uh, is there, yeah, a, reason, me, is there like, a reason for that, Jason? Because I mean, like you said, most artists would normally work on at least like a page and finish the page and then move on, right? And they might even write it in that style. A lot of guys, you're much more like you've got your vision really tightly laid out before you're even putting ink on the paper. Yeah, um, I like. Yeah, I like to. I like to have. Every, every single, you know, I dotted and T crossed and, you know, make, make sure everything's airtight um, before, uh, before I start inking, just in case, uh, you know, there's something I want, there's some, something I want to go back and change. Um, and it, it, it happens, it happens a fair amount where, um, you know, I'll, I'll write myself into a corner um, and then I, you know, I just have to go back to the beginning and, you know, change a few things. So, you know, it, lo it looks like, you know, it looks like I'm really clever, but, uh, at, you know, actually if, if you, uh, write something backwards, then, uh, you know, it looks like you're more clever than you actually are. Okay. Um, okay. Well, let's talk clever for a second. I'm sorry, clever guy. So let's talk about the end pages <laughs> because, okay, you look at this, it's a random pattern. And you look at this and it's a random pattern, but if you hold it up to the light, I can't, it doesn't work here. And if you shine the light through this thing though, there's a secret message on this end page. I, I looked for it during my last review, but I couldn't find it. I remembered it was there, but I couldn't find it. Tell me about the secret message, please. And what, oh, what, what so, so there's a, uh, there's a secret, there's a secret message in the end papers. Um, if you hold it up to the light, um, there's a marriage proposal to my wife. Yeah, like that, like that. Can you see? Yeah, that? Alina, will you marry me? Is that right? Yes, yes. She got <laughs> super fan, Jason. Super fan, Aww. dude. Actually, Aww. you pointed that out. You showed it to me uh, <laughs> at, at an ape shortly after that debuted, and I was just like, yet another thing that a lot of work and a lot of thought went into that, doing that, that literally 99.9% .9 of the people who read that book are not gonna ever notice. Um, no. And I love it. And I love it. And she said, yes, she said, yes. And she said, that's <laughs> the important part. And then I think I also said, I came up to you and I said, Jason, after reading your comics for all these years, I just didn't take you as a marrying kind of guy. And you looked at me like, <laughs> like, what am I, what? <laughs> so apologies for that. If I insulted you that, that. 
but I never thought I was a marrying kind of guy either. And now here we are, you know, 10, 20 years later, whatever. (laughs) Talking to each other. (laughs) Talking to each other about comics. With Um, kids, with kids, no less. Okay. So, so now, now we got to, we got to Abrams. Then you went off and you did something which I consider again super forward looking and like the future one potential future of comics, which was you crowdfund. Well, you didn't quite crowdfund. You went the Patreon route, right? And yes, which if anybody doesn't know, you sign up to be a to be a Shiga patron, and you give Shiga a few bucks a month. <laughs> We'll give him we we'll give him a second, folks. Uh, you give Shiga a few bucks a month, and he what? would send you. Um, here we go, <laughs> and he'd send you a mini comic. And every I think it was every other month, I got in the mail a demon mini comic, and it sure looks handmade to me. I'm assuming they were, but I don't know. Um, again, on the inside. Went with a, a third ink color, maybe was it this or no, a second ink color? Sorry. Um, but I know you also used a weird printing process. I, was it called Risograph or what is the? Tell me a little bit about the process you went through on Demon. Um, yeah, I, uh, I printed them all on a, uh, a Risograph printer. Um, okay. Hold on. Yeah. Um, well, Jason. Looks for his risograph printer. Uh, I'm just going to say that uh, Demon, you can't get this deluxe slip cover edition anymore, but you can get the three uh, graphic novels that you should pick that up wherever finer comics and graphic novels are sold. All right, now you're going to give us a demo? Um. Uh, no. No. But, <laughs> um, yeah, it's just adjusting my phone. Um, but I was going to tell you about the uh, the Risograph uh, process. Yeah, that's what I want to know. That's what I want to um, know about. So it's super, it's super, super interesting. Um, it, oh, ah. Wait a minute. Jason, don't make me put up the... Don't make me put up the... Uh, stand by. Please stand by. <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay, there we go. There we go. Um, so yeah, the uh, the uh, risograph process is super interesting. Um, there's um, uh, it's a type of uh, a type of printer, um, and uh. Unlike uh, photocopy machines, instead of uh, uh, working with toner, it works with actual uh, wet ink. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't know if you uh, ever uh, looked inside like a uh, photocopy machine, but it's there's like this black powder, uh, you know, that gets uh, kind of stuck onto your paper with static electricity, and then it goes through. It gets like superheated, and then yeah. Um, you know, baked at like a million degrees and, you know, it turns into, uh, you know, it, tur- it turns into, uh, you know, a printed photocopy page. But um, uh, with Risographs, uh, it's, it's, ba- it's essentially a machine that, uh, that makes silk screens. Uh, you burn like a, a little screen and uh, it, uh, you can start printing, printing out pages um with uh with so like you're rolling out and, uh, you're like putting ink and rolling it out by hand on onto the screens or like or you're no, sending no, it to a printer it's all it's all automated in this machine oh cool uh and it, it looks i mean it's this it's this giant machine it looks it looks like a photocopy machine but uh it the um uh mechanically it's uh it's completely different so um, anyway, so why does this thing exist? Uh, like, what is it traditionally used for? I because I'd never heard of it before. I, before I heard you talking about it. Um, so it's um, I guess for some reason they were uh, they were popular in the nineties with like churches and schools uh, as 
an alternative to a photocopy machine. Hmm. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, for whatever reason in the, uh, you know, 2010s, uh, they, uh, they started becoming popular, um, with, uh, cartoonists and, uh, you know, printmakers, um, mm -hmm. cause, uh, you know, the, the nice, like, like really, uh, organic, uh, way that they, uh, that they look. Right, because Anyways, well, I mean, frankly, um, it looks I like myself a, uh, yeah. A... yeah, doesn't that look nice? Oh. So okay, so <laughs> I see other cartoonists though that want to get a similar look. Maybe I'm thinking of like an Ed Piscor hip hop family tree, right? And he went with I think like a, like a, just a different paper stock and maybe some Photoshop or something effects. This is strikes me as an expensive and like time consuming and like weird process. Um, what, what I just wonder, do, did you ever consider like going, say, a more digital uh, uh, production route to try and achieve some of the same aesthetic effects, but like in a, in a non analog way? Or is that like just the look on your face is like, why would I do? Why would I? Do, <laughs> why would I even think of doing that? <laughs> Oh <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, yeah. I mean, it's um, it was is actually pretty cheap um to make uh, since I was making them all myself. Um, I was uh, I was actually initially uh, toying with the idea of getting them self published, uh, like the way I made uh, Double Happiness. You know, just going through a commercial printer. Um. But uh, yeah, you know, I just sat down, did you know, did the arithmetic, and you know, figured it it would actually be cheaper to, uh, you know, to buy this risograph and start printing them up myself. Oh, and I think is that the uh, is that the uh, printed version? Oh, what? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Wait, is that a risograph or is that a? This is a this is a mini. This is one of the minis. Right, I don't know if there was a different version. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> so I loved it month to month. It's a um, roller coaster. It's a roller coaster ride of a comic like no other. I mean, it's obviously like you went okay, Fleep, and then you went Book Hunter to take this to like learn your chops as an action director. That was like your early, and then you went and made your magnum opus of action that takes it not just to like a a slightly larger scale you go to like an interplanetary scale at some points in this in this book um as i remember and take this concept of the demon uh sort of a high concept single high concept sci-fi type scenario right where there's this one there's this thing um and yeah. and and just took it in a crazy direction I, I don't want to even I don't want to go into that per se because what I want to go now is what you were alluding to before, like you went then you went the self published route with with Demon and the Patreon funded route and that seemed to work out pretty well for you, um, but then after that you said you know what getting money from re directly from regular people, not into it I want a nation state to tax their people and then. <laughs> channel that money directly into my cartooning so tell me about your residency and and that process and what what happened there um so yeah after, um, after demon uh i me and my family we applied for a residency in angoulême france and uh for those who don't know angoulême is the comics capital of europe it's a it's a whole town um just uh just filled filled with cartoonists uh so they've got the uh they've got the big festival there every year uh but uh they also have tons of professional two animation studios uh three art schools uh they believe it or not they have a manga school um where uh that just started like three or four years ago and uh and they have this uh this residency um that invites 30 cartoonists from all over the world um to work at this one studio um in Angoulême 
and it's um you know it's all it's all funded by the uh you know the whatever the department of culture in um in france and uh it's yeah it's it's amazing uh I went there with my family and uh, I got to work in the studio with uh, cartoonists from Iran and Korea, Mexico. Um, yeah, just every, uh, every, every, every corner of the earth that you can imagine. And, uh, you know, we were all working on our projects. And uh, I guess one of the interesting things about this residency is um, you just, you can work on whatever project you want. Uh, there's really no requirements. And they, uh, yeah, they just set you up with, um, you know, with a studio and uh, in some cases uh, with housing, free housing. And so they paid your room and board wonderful. and expenses, living expenses, childcare expenses for how long? One year. One year, uh, man. And, and uh, what did you do? And what did you do with that one year time? Um, uh, I, how yes. can I describe this? Um, <laughs> so, uh, I wanted, I wanted to, um, I wanted to kind of take advantage of it and, uh, and, you know, kind of do, um, what I would call my, uh, my moonshot, uh, comic, uh, you know, something, um, something that could uh, potentially have no commercial value at all. Um, but, you know, uh, just, yeah, just something that would be for me, um, uh, you know, the, just the, the comic that I would like to see most in the world, um, but that doesn't exist. Uh, and I can actually show you a tiny little preview. I'll be right back. What? Com a comic book news exclusive? Awesome. Man, can you imagine that, folks? You get a year to yourself to do whatever you want. As an artist, amazing. What an opportunity to have. Oh, here we go. Let me solo you here. This is it. This is, uh, this is kind of the... Uh, uh, for this uh, for this book, um, as you can see, it's actually two books, and they're connected by this uh, third spine over here. And the idea, whoops, the idea is you open the book up like this, you open the book up like this, and there's uh, two sets of pages that you can follow. It's like meanwhile in that there's tabs. That directly from one page to the other. But unlike meanwhile, you can actually follow the tabs across this third spine and into the uh, the other section of, of the book. Oh. And when Jeez. uh so wait, it it gets crazier because yeah. when you're when you're reading one section of the book. The page of the other section of the book is used to store uh, a kind of working memory, a working stack memory. Okay. Um, so the uh, so the project is actually a little, very r rudimentary analog computer. It's a little state uh, machine, and 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 I didn't get to yeah. bring up. One of the more rare Shiga experiments, Hello World, which was a yes. state machine with an inventory. I talked about it on my last call, but I think my copy, I don't know what happened to my copy of that. And as a programmer, the name Hello World means something. I'm a software guy. Hello World is like the very first program a programmer writes in any given new language. I know you know this. Yes. And I know that was yeah. maybe, I'm thinking that's why you named it that because it was your ex initial experiment in this idea that you wanted to expand. And, and is that what has now become, is it called the box or just box? It, it's called the box. Okay. And um, it's funny that you mentioned Hello World because it, um, 
it uh, it's very similar to Hello World, um, except uh, it's it's uh, it's different in in Hello World. There's uh, there's the story pages and then there's the inventory pages, but yes. uh, but in the box they're all every page is a story page and an inventory page. Uh, it's an inventory page uh, when you're reading the story pages in the other section. And it's a story page when the other section is working as the inventory page. Okay. So uh, each set of pages switches off between being the memory and the, uh, I guess, what you could call the processor. Anyways, um, it's, like I said, it's kind of my moonshot uh, comic um a comic that you know could be so crazy so out there um that it's yeah it's uh you know just kind of beyond beyond anything that's out there and uh it's yeah just really pushing me to uh you know to my abilities and uh and beyond so it's, could this be the oh first gosh, it's been touring complete comic i don't like like i would are we are do we have to worry about this thing spawning its own artificial intelligence and taking over the world? I'm a little concerned. I'm a little concerned. Oh, so yeah, it's uh, it, technically it's not Turing complete. Um, there's no uh, you wouldn't be able to uh program any. You any can't add any new it. stuff to the tape, right? Yeah. Um. No rewrite head on the tape. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but yeah, so yeah, so you, you know, I don't know. You don't, you don't have, you don't have to worry about this, you know, some, uh, you know, some, uh, robotic foot, you know, crushing a skull underneath. Um, you know, the hardest thing about reading Meanwhile, in my opinion, yeah. I love it. The hardest thing about reading this type of comic is like marking your place, like bookmarking it because just marking where you, what page you're on is not enough in one of these extravaganzas. Right. Um, uh, well, this one you might need, you might need two bookmarks. <laughs> I think you need post-it. <laughs> I think you need little post-its to say where you, like you need a mark and a post-it to say what panel you're on and maybe which direction you're, I don't even know. Um, right. All I know is that Jason Shiga comics are challenging to read sometimes, but in a good way, in the best way. Like not challenging in that they're hard to read because your visual language is so, I don't wanna say simple, but it's simplified and manages to communicate a lot of information, a lot of very complicated information with a very, very few marks on the page. Um, and I think that's very difficult and um, the sign of a great cartoonist which is what you are. Um, <laughs> and I love it, man. I love it. I love th that you've been able to um, not compromise on your vision of what a comic could be. I, I, I like that you've been successful and you didn't have to fit it into the mold of a superhero for sure. But also you're not in the, you're not a wannabe Robert Crumb or a wannabe Dan Klaus or a wannabe anybody. You're a, you're a Jason Shiga and other people want to be you, man. They want to put out comics as cool as you. Um, so, man. Well, you know, if. Wait, uh, oh, I, I was, was going to say, if, if, uh, if, if, if I could be anybody, if I could have any cartoonist career, it would be uh, Yoshihiro Tatsumi. That's who I would want to be. I'm and I'm drawing a blank on on what his yeah he's my work. Oh, uh, he did um. Oh, uh, he did like tons of stuff for Godall, uh, the Black Blizzard when he was younger, and then uh, um, later in his life he did those uh, uh, uh those uh, autobio comics. Uh, I think a Drifting Life was uh. Was oh, name. okay. Yes. Okay. Drifting Life. I'm familiar with this. I'm, 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 my, manga is my probably my weakest area of comics, I would have to say. Um, but man, I, I got to say that 
there's a lot of people out there that would love your comics. I've never heard of them. Don't know where to get them. Don't know how to get them. Frankly, like, Demon, you can pick up. Demon's out there. There's three graphic novels from first, second publishers. You guys can pick those up. Four. Book hub. Four. Oh, I'm sorry. It's four volumes. I'm sorry. Is it only three are out already, or are all four out in stores now? All, all four are out. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm not, dude. I was in it. You can get them. for the minis, man. So I'm sorry. Sorry, I didn't know a lot <laughs> about that format. Um. But well, that's okay. I, I just I, want to say, I, I always think of the minis as its true form, right? And well, so what I want to get, where I want to know next is box. Okay, what's the plans for it? When when do I get to get my hot hands on uh, on your box, so to speak? <laughs> I um, well, that's the that's the thing. That's kind of the uh, the leap of faith I took with this project, which is um, I don't have a publisher uh, lined up for it. Um, it's uh you know it's like it's like those old days it's you know it's like the uh it's like the 90s all over again um i'm uh you know i'm like uh you know indiana jones in the uh last crusade when he you know leaps uh you know takes that uh walk of faith off the cliff i'm just uh i'm just making it and uh if i'm hoping i'm hoping the publisher will want to publish it when it's done and uh I'm uh, and I think I'll be done this year. Um, maybe uh, by the summer, maybe by the fall, we'll see. And uh, yeah, I'm just uh, keeping my fingers crossed. Uh, and uh, we'll, I'll let you know. I'll keep you posted. Okay. okay well, I'll, I'll let you end with this, Jason. You're a math guy, so so tell me this: six hundred pages, did you say in that thing? Yep. Yep. Okay, and you said it cost about two thousand dollars per die cut. Uh, yep. <laughs> so what's it gonna? So give me a rough cost on die cuts only here. What are we? I mean, that's a lot of money, man. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a wait. What is that? <laughs> two, I don't know. Two thousand. Two thousand is uh twelve a hundred and twenty thousand dollars just in uh die cutting alone. Oh, uh, God, I, I feel bad for this publisher. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what I want to say, Jason. Crowdfund. Yes. If you cannot find a publisher willing to put that money up, kickstart that puppy or whatever. And I man, I've seen people raise a lot more than that on a lot less deserving comics, in my humble opinion. Uh yeah, I think that you could get, man, if you got nation states subsidizing your cartooning output, I think that you can run a successful crowdfunding campaign if that's what it comes down to. Um, okay. So I hope you will, I hope you'll consider oh. that the world. <laughs> I hope, I hope it doesn't come to that. I agree, but, but I just hope we don't have to wait another, how, how long we're going to have to wait to get that, to get that comic, right? Because I really want it. Um, the world wants it. You've given them a little taste. Um, any thoughts about bringing any of your older out of print stuff back into print fleet being one of them, double happiness, any of the, any of the other stuff, hello world for that matter. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm too, I'm too busy focused on the future. I'm, uh, I'm not looking back. Got it. I'm, you know, I'm like a shark. I got to keep moving forward. Okay. Well, that's the perfect note to end this call on. <laughs> um, thank you so much for all this time. I'm going to take this thing. I'm going to chop out our little technical difficulty segment right there in the middle. And uh, and and okay. you can expect to see it up on YouTube soon. Jason Shiga, thank oh. you so much for doing this. I, I, I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Um, stick around for a second. Oh, um, I appreciate you around for just a sec um so oops <laughs> so everybody out there this was the great jason shiga uh, you saw my review of fleep and some of his other stuff you got to get a little peek inside of what's going on inside that noggin and there's a lot happening um most importantly though you know a lot of people like 
are, are kind of like feel distance from like art comics and stuff that's not mainstream format, typical type of formats and stories. Let me just tell you, a Jason Shiga comic is that rare breed of things that is intellectually stimulating and interesting, but also utterly accessible to the most like, to the person with the most, uh, 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 I don't want to say common, but it's kind of like mainstream taste and action and, and, and adventure and just fun stories. So go seek out some Shiga books. Go check out Meanwhile, Book Hunter and definitely Demon and then Quiver in Anticipation uh, for the release of the box. Thanks everybody for watching. Uh, stick around if you haven't already. Hit subscribe, hit like on that thing, on that notification thing. And uh, thanks everybody. Thank you, Jason, one more time. And uh, we'll see you on next time. Bye-bye.